And what was your branch of service, John? Uh, the Army. And your highest rank when you got out? Spec 4. And just kind of, can you tell me in what general locations you served, you know, countries and states? Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and the United States. Okay. So, when when did you enlist? Or which, tell me how you ended up in the military. Were you drafted or were you enlisted? I enlisted, um, I kind of knew before I graduated high school I was going to end up in the service. And uh, I wanted to go. Uh, a lot was going on in the world, and I guess I wanted to find out about it. And um, that, I graduated in 1968 from high school, and with the intention of going to college, I had gone to college for a year and um, decided I wasn't quite ready for college and enlisted in the Army for four years, which ended up only being three because of um, military factors. And... Where were you living at the time of your enlistment? I was living in West Hartford, Connecticut. Okay, so you, you felt the need. This Vietnam was going pretty strong, right? This yeah, so that's why I, a lot of people I, I, I kind of knew I was I probably had, I kind of gave this some thought. I, probably at age 15 or 16, I knew I was going to end up in the Army. It was kind of a given. I, my father was a World War II veteran, you know, but he never smoked, uh, spoke too much about the war, you know. How did your family feel about you? Um, I don't. My mother never really uh, said too much. My dad, uh, it's a funny story. He said, "You, you could be what, anything you want," but he said, "Don't be an MP because if you become an MP, don't come home." And I never really found out the the um, history, of, you know, of what he ever did. Uh, have such a disdain for MPs, but um, and you know. I know, I've never... Why Why did you pick the Army as opposed to the uh, Navy, Air Force, Marines? Well, my dad was in the Army. My almost ended up in the uh, in the Marine Corps. I went down to the recruiter in High Street in Hartford one day. And it was, it's funny, I remember my uh, enlistment sergeant, Sergeant Rogers, wasn't there. And there were two Marines in uh, very nice uniforms. And they, I was playing football at the time, post-high school, too. And I was in excellent shape, so they said they they would uh, make an excellent Marine out of me. And unfortunately at the time I lost a friend I knew from high school that was in the Marine Corps. So I had told them that I wasn't gonna join the Marines because they didn't believe in artillery support. <laughs> and I already had my mind made up anyways. I was just being a little snarky for a young kid, you know. <laughs> so you, you enlisted? And you moved on, you went to your basic training? I went to ba that. basic training at Fort Dix. I went, it was May through, I think, August, hotter than hell. And um, it was uneventful. I guess the best thing to do when you go through basic training is keep your, keep a, what they used to call a low profile and keep your mouth quiet and you, you do all right. And I did all right and got orders to go to the um, Army Security Agency school at Fort Devons, Massachusetts, and I reported in August there. Well, how was your basic training for you? Was it, was, did you find it very challenging? Or, or it, no, I didn't find it um, too physically challenging because, I, like I said, I played sports in high school and a little bit post-high school, so I was in good shape, and I didn't have any problem handling it. Um, there was, you know, first time away from home, but it was it was kind of exciting. I didn't, uh, I didn't mind it at all. I just basically did what I was told and that was about it and the only outstanding thing I remember from basic training was that we were with Sergeant Jackson he was about the size of an NFL linebacker and most of our drill sergeants were Vietnam veterans at the time this being 1970 we were w walking through the uh, sand pines of New Jersey and I kind of was dragging my feet and he came behind me and put a boot in my backside telling me that stragglers would be killed in Vietnam if you were out make, you know, breaking a trail through the, you know, the jungle or wherever you were. And it kind of made a good impression on me that this was serious business. So you completed your basic training and you moved on and went to the security agency? Yes, Army Security Agency, which is the mil military side of National Security Agency. We, uh, I always refer to it as and this NSA is a low paid help. Okay. Well, tell me about that. What, what was your, what, why were you there? Were you there for MOS training, for uh, YOP training? Yes, 
I, I was there for MOS training. I had a, a nondescript MOS called Traffic Analyst, which would, <coughs> excuse me, would be equivalent to a signals intelligence analyst nowadays and, uh, and involved uh, analyzing uh, intercepted and decoded or decrypted enemy radio or voice transmissions to uh, discern location, order battle, and intent of the units that you were opposed to in a combat zone. So did you have to go to language school? Did you know, did you learn Vietnamese? Uh, no, I had taken the test for language school. I purposely failed the Vietnamese language school because it was a year-long school and it was in uh, Monterey, at the Vietnamese school was in Monterey, California. And I didn't want, I had already been in college a year and I didn't want to, I didn't join the army to, to go to school for another year. Kind of a dumb mistake because later on a lot of my friends had gone to the school and it helped them out. But no, I didn't uh, go to language school. So what was the, the ASA like? What were you doing? What was it like your day-to-day -day activities there? March to class and KP duty and uh, some physical training, but it was mostly classroom work. Uh, we were waiting... All of us, most of the MOSs required a top secret clearance with a cryptographic access. So we were waiting for that to come through. And once you got that, you got into the meat of your, your classroom instruction. Um, one of the interesting facts were that uh, the, the training was uh, geared towards Vietnam, but there were different le uh, levels of uh, where you could be assigned. You could be assigned to a field station, which was for the most part, um, state like stateside duty, you'd be in a building in an office, or you could be in a tactical direct support unit like I was. But you didn't when you were in school, you didn't know that you didn't know your uh, assignments at all. Um, you you filled out what was called as a dream sheet, and you made your choices. And uh, part of the, the training that everybody got was the last two weeks of MOS training, and they called it. Um, I believe it was called Target Area Orientation Training, and it was a Vietnamese village set up in off of Route 2A in Air, Massachusetts, in the woods. Run, and they had, the army had um, Oriental folks that were enlisted, and they were purposely put into this Vietnamese village so that you could learn survival, escape, and evasion um, for part of your orientation to go into Vietnam. And little little known fact, but you, I mean. Yeah. And um, it was it was good tactical training. Plus, which they did, everybody, I mean, folks in training now use laser guns. Back then, we they were using BB guns, and so we were getting shot at with BB guns or captured and put, you know held for prisoner when you were tried to you know for lit for twenty four hours. And I did it in the interestingly enough, I did it in jungle fatigues in late November with snow on the ground, which it, which I thought was kind of ironic because we were going to Vietnam. But um, and out of school, I volunteered for Vietnam. There was nine nine people in my class, and I kind of got chided. Why did you, you know, sign up to go to Vietnam? And um, I said, well, what the hell are we learning anyways? We're learning. We're going to go there. So out of the class, not, uh, seven out of nine, we, we got orders for uh, Vietnam and uh, Two of guys, I believe, got orders for Germany. So I came home, at, it was Christmas time, uh, late 70. Came home for a month leave, packed all my stuff up, and um, early January reported to Oakland Army Terminal in California for a shipment uh, to Vietnam. They put us in quarantine so that you couldn't go into the towns and kind of escape for a while, but a few guys did. But um, while there, I... I got diverted to, uh, well, actually, I spent my 20, 21st birthday there waiting to ship out in quarantine. And we, myself and those seven people on orders to Vietnam, got diverted to Thailand without orders. And uh, basically, a captain came down and said, Get on the plane, you're going to Thailand. I was the only one who was disappointed because I had psychologically prepared myself to go to Vietnam. We landed in Bangkok. Uh, which hasn't probably changed much. It's like a big New York City, and we were billeted in a Liberty Hotel, which, what, which was a new treat after being in World War II barracks. So wh while there, we were um, 
they gave us, they called us in and they said, well, how'd you guys basically get here? Because they had our personal records and everything. And we said, you know, the guy with the captain bar said, get on the plane, but your daughters will be waiting. Seriously. So <laughs> you're an E4, so you're not going to... Yeah. <laughs> so um, after they made some calls to the Army personnel, which we had our own, own personnel folks at Ben Hill Farms, I believe. So they had to go through the Army and through the Army Security Agency to place us because they didn't know where to send us. So they gave us the choice. Uh, they called us in and said, you, we'll give you three choice. You know, you can uh, stay here, you could go to Japan, or you could go to Korea. Well, being January, I knew Korea would be cold. And then um, Japan was crowded and looked outside. It was 86 degrees out in January in a swimming pool in the hotel. And I said, I'll stay right here in Thailand. So I, the the folks were nice. So I mean, the, the military was good. They we had to wait for port call orders to, sh to fly up north. So we got an extra week in Bangkok on on the government, um, just sitting in the pool and going out and um, be waiting for our orders to come. So we um, eventually ended up flying up C one thirty to Udon, which is approximately in the middle of the country up no on the northern border on the Mekong River, almost opposite uh, Vien Chen Laos. So I was assigned to the 8th Radio Research, uh, yeah, I think it's the 8th. Uh, no, uh, 7th in Thailand, excuse me, and the 8th is over in Vietnam. Um, so I was assigned there, I was, um, I guess I can tell you what I was doing. I was involved with low-level tactical uh, uh, it planted what was going on in the plane of jars. We had Air America people there. We had CIA people with, uh, they were off the books kind of folks. And they were running the Laotian um, war in the plane of jars. At the time, the Chinese were building a road into into Laos. Uh, American pilots were being shot down over the in Laos. And we were um, developing intelligence for that. We, we had guys that broke the code. We I would just identify units. It was basically a desk job. It was, it was, it was interesting, but it was uh, since he operated at the field station 24/7. I worked swing shift, which would be four to eleven. So basically, I would go into work at four, get off at eleven. I had really no extra duty because they had Thai women uh, do the clean the barracks, polish our boots, starch our fatigues. So it was basically a civilian job. Again, not what. What was, it, what was it, you call it? Plane of Jars? Plane of Jars in northern Laos. That's a, a location? That's a location. Plane of Jars. Plane of Jars. Plane of jars. Okay. Yeah. It would be, I believe, up in the northeastern part of the country. Air America folks were there. Uh, basically, we would, Air America flew out of Udorn Air Force Base at the time. There's a book, I think, called The Ravens. It's kind of tells some of the history. And um, we would get, until, part of what we would analyze was captured intelligence data from these guys. They would they come into our field station and bring us in actually burn bags with data in them, uh, transcript, I mean documents, things like that. And they were, it, it, looking back on it, it's kind of funny because it's like we, if you ever saw the Nicolas Cage movie or America, these guys had the cowboy sh shirts and civilians, you know, the civilian clothes and they didn't talk too much. And you know, one time I tried to engage one of them in conversation in our little small PX, and he wasn't even wearing a U.S. uniform and no rank, and he went and didn't want to talk too much, which I understand why, you know, being being more experienced now, what the history was. So, but one one time they had uh, there was a, a battle going on up there, and they would evacuate the wounded down to the Air Force base, and they didn't eat, they'd set up a tent hospital city. They didn't even uh, integrate them with the uh, regular military people in, in Udorn. So it was, it was pretty easy duty. I mean, uh, I was single. I had, you know, so na naturally you had some bar time at night. And uh, But it was again, it wasn't what I was uh, looking for, you know, in the military. Uh, so about four, four to five months co coming in, you know, being in country and working, uh, they they put out a request for volunteers for Vietnam. And I'm going like, geez, I was supposed to go there four months ago. Now they're asking. You gotta you know, gotta wonder what who's who's running the show. 
So um, I went down to personnel and I volunteered for Vietnam. <laughs> and everybody thought I was crazy. So I, I ended up um, flying Air France, well, again, waiting for orders down in Bangkok to get on the plane at the airport to fly over to Vietnam. And they, knowing the personnel people were good, knowing that I was going to Vietnam, they didn't give me a port call date to fly out. So I had to go again and wait another week. So basically within four months, I had two to three weeks of uh, leave that didn't count as leave. It was casual duty. So I ended up flying Air France. And I remember on a plane with goats and chickens and everything else. It wasn't a military flight to uh, Saigon and uh, landed in Saigon uh, around, I think, May 1st and um, got off the plane and the first thing that struck me was the oppressive heat of being, well, I mean, we were at Tonson Up. It was the flight line and the uh, flight lines I've learned since then in my civilian job are pretty damn hot in the summertime or any time. So I got off the plane, we, we walked into the hangar and the first thing, you know, you, you had the, the heat, the smells, and um, the first thing I hear is the guys are going out, tripping back home, and I hear, you'll be sorry. And you're kind of like mockingly, these guys are going home, and I'm going like, what the heck did I get myself into? <laughs> so I ended up uh, kind of vague on what happened after that. I ended up going to the 509th Radio Research Group at Davis Station, I believe. Uh, Davis was the first American killed in Vietnam. Uh, and he was an Army Security Agency soldier. So that was where all Army Security Agency soldiers went to. The way to orders to go to either a field station, which was again like stateside duty for the most part, depending on when you were there, or to a direct support unit, which was out in the field with the infantry and uh, doing that. So p part of the time, I my memories of uh, Saigon are, you know, kind of long few and fleeting, but I do remember riding on a caged bus with the, with the wire screens on, this, on the windows wondering why they had the wire screens later to find out that so nobody could throw a grenade in where you were. And um, also I had to do casual duty. Well, part of the casual duty was I had to ride shotgun or guard on an ice truck making the rounds to NCO clubs in, <laughs> in Saigon. And uh, deliver an ice, and which was kind of oh, kind of strange. <laughs> I mean, it kind of zero. You know, it's like I guess this is the army. This is the way the military is. It, you know, it's structured, but it's not structured. So uh, I spent some time there, maybe a week to two, and I received orders to go to the field station in uh, Fubai. So I flew C one thirty up to Fubai. And that was a field station in space. It was the 8th Radio Research Field Station. Um, so I wasn't really enthused about being there. So I volunteered to go to uh, the 265th Radio Research Unit, which was part of the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, when that company deployed to Vietnam, when the 1st Brigade went over, they went over, one, comp one platoon went over with the 1st Brigade separate, and then a few late years later, um, the rest of the company went over on, um, on boats, actually. The boat, we used to call them the boat people. It was, at the time, it was an all airborne unit. They were all jump qualified. I, myself, when I joined them, it was an air mobile unit. I wasn't a paratrooper, but I served with a lot of them because of the Vietnam War and attrition. They, in, in the intelligence background, they put non airborne people into airborne, you know, into an airborne unit. Which was, fun, which was fine because I made a lot of good friends and a lot of guys um, were and weren't. But uh, the month I was waiting to go up to this unit, the month I got there, I was at Fubai. I, I worked a little bit, but my majority of my duty, I was on a mortar platoon. So I basically learned 11 Charlie, I was in a, which was a mortarman. I was an assistant gunner, and we would do night defensive shooting in uh, illumination missions at night. And um, it was interesting. It was, you know, better than being in a trailer working, you know, uh, analyzing NBA units and the such. And when my orders came to uh, go to the 101st, I went up to the division headquarters of the 265th and um, spent some time there. And we worked 
we supported the division headquarters, the G2, excuse me, the, um, yeah, the G2 is the intelligence level for division. And um, we worked with them and basically they, they, they were involved with um, oper operations of the 101st. Now, a little bit of history on, on the company. The company was three platoons and um, what they did it, I mean, yeah, it was comprised of three platoons, each platoon supporting a brigade of the 101st. Uh, in the headquarters company, or in the headquarters platoon, supporting division. Uh, one other platoon supporting 3rd um, Brigade, I believe, was at Camp Evans, north of Eagle and Way. Another one was down at Camp Hockmouth, which was on the Fubai uh, campus, so to speak. And they su supported a division brigade down that way. Um, after being at, at the, through attrition and being in the, uh, headquarters company, I got asked to go to 1st Platoon, which supported 1st Brigade on the back, what we call the back gate of Camp Eagle, Gee, Gee Lin or something like that. Each platoon um, had a different mission, and we sometimes we interacted, sometimes we we um, met at headquarters company when there was a company function or a meeting or something like that when we had to work um, a problem. Most of the guys were Morse intercept operators or voice intercept operators. Morse being Morse code, they had uh, usually used American gear or captured Chinese radios to intercept uh, radio, uh, radio transmissions of the NBA. And that's who we were opposed to at that time in 71, mid to late 71. There were not any... Um, Viet Cong being decimated in after um, Tet of 68 in the Battle for Way and such up there. I mean, the folks I saw were NBA regulars, uh, equipped well in haircuts and fresh uniforms. But uh, we had guys at Hamburger Hill prior to I being there, uh, guys at Ripcord were sitting on the hilltops warning the uh, king of the hill, so to speak, the infantry commander out there of impending attacks. And the reason they had to be out in these uh, forward areas is because the NBA radio transmissions only sometimes travels, you know, several thousand yards at best, and you had to be on top of them to be able to locate the units and somewhat, you know, either find out their intentions because a lot of times they didn't talk in secure, um, secure voice. They would be out in the clear, what we used to call the clear. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened with First Brigade is. We had guys out in the field, but through attrition towards guys going home at the end of the tour, um, one of my platoon sergeants came up the, with the idea of uh, putting our captured radio into uh, a UE helicopter, an H-model helicopter. And um, that's what I got involved in primarily uh, most of my time with the 101st. Um, what we, what, well, his name was Dave Goss, and he passed three about three years ago to Agent Orange and basically what we did is we had a, chi a Chicom radio in the helicopter we had a Vietnamese linguist or a, or a guy that could do code depending on the mission we were flying and we uh, <coughs> excuse me put our antennas tied to were laterally tied to the whip uh, the whip antennas are tied to the skids of the helicopter with duct tape and we had secure voice uh, FM in the helicopter so that um, we could transmit our information, uh, real to what they call down real time, to the uh, artillery units on the ground below or infantry units, so they could engage in the uh, engage in the enemy if they if the uh, S two decided at that point to do that to take action. Um, we generally flew at um, under a thousand feet, sometimes five hundred feet, because you'd have to be on top of the target, being the radio transmitter and the NBA folks. And uh, we, um, and how we, the mission came up and it was, it was strictly a volunteer mission and we weren't an aviation unit so we would have to, our company commander would task, I believe either the 101st Aviation Company or the 101st, uh, 158th Aviation Company, 101st for a, helico for a helicopter show up on our pad and basically, we get in there with a, a map and tell, and the pilots kind of, they weren't Army Security Agency pilots, but they had somewhat of a clearance. So we would uh, set up the secure FM forum 
and we would tell them where to fly. And generally we flew in the western Ashot Valley along the uh, Laotian border into Laos a little bit um, unofficially because we weren't supposed to be there and it was late in the war and they didn't want to, you know, folks didn't want to go home in a bag basically or the higher ups didn't want the guys to go home in a bag because, uh, you know, it's not a bad a good way to end the day. So uh, my platoon sergeant and Captain Le Dave Gossett and Captain Leftall, who I'm still friends with today after all these years, and I was friends with Dave and a few other guys, uh, asked for volunteers of our platoon to uh, fly. And most of the guys being within about a month uh, decided uh, they weren't going to fly. And uh, which, you know, you, you know, couldn't blame them. It was strictly, vol everything was volunteer. I mean, to go to the unit was a volunteer uh, move, and certainly to go to Vietnam, even though I would have ended up there. So we flew the missions, and it was pretty, it was interesting. It kind of, um, I still love aviation, and plus it was uh, a good way to cool off. And I got to see a lot of the, the geographic, we were up in the mountains, so it was pretty cool flying in uh, pretty desolate areas, too, because you never wanted to go down, and and how we, I mean, I remember one of the outstanding um, stupid things I said as a young soldier was that after we start, just started this mission, I said to uh, the Sergeant Gossett, or Staff Sergeant Gossett, that this be a lot of fun flying around. You know, I, I'd never been up in a helicopter before. And I knew he had been in Vietnam a year before with the 173rd Airborne, and he had flown. Well, he took about a step back, kicked me in the, in the rear end, only the second time in my military time he got kicked in the rear end. And he said to me, um, you won't think it's much fun if we get shot down. And I went like, oh, yeah, right, you know, young kid, insert foot and mouth. And I mean, I had already been there a while, so I knew, I had an idea that this was serious business, but flying along, I as the pilots talked on the phone, we were all wired in together. You could hear the guys talk, the pilots say, well, that's where Joe you know, Joe Blow got shot down, and this guy got captured, this guy got killed, and I really realized uh, how serious um, this could be, you know, and probably the most um, strange thing that ever happened is we were out flying along the Laotian border, and uh, we had known, I guess it was the 520th NBA Battalion, I'm not, I'm not sure, if that's the right designation, was operating. And they had shot down one of our 101st Cobras the day before. And so we got tasked to try to find where that unit was. So while we're out there flying and looking around, we, uh, we picked up transmissions and we were flying back with the data back to the 101st. Um, we made a low pass over three uh, folks, uh, crossing the stream in the open and uh, one of them looked to be like a courier and um, I was on the left side of the helicopter it was, it was uh, no, yeah, November and the reason that I remember it was I found through paperwork later it was no, uh, November 11th 1971 and uh, I got waved at by North Vietnamese troops mm -hmm. and I waved back but they were clearing North Vietnamese because they were wearing um the uh, Vietnamese bamboo hats over their helmets, and they had packs with, like, I could only describe it as ponchos made out of plastic bags over their packs, and they were hiding their rifles behind them. And so, uh, basically, the pilot said, did you think those were, and I said, yeah. And we turned around and made a, a 180 and went after them because we were, you know, we were soldiers, too. We weren't just ASA guys flying around the, you know, you know, for scenery. So um, basically we cornered them off and um, Sergeant Gossett, we went down to try to capture one of um, the, the courier. He ended up shooting the courier that day and I got out of the helicopter because we we're on, kind of on the ground and protected the, the rest of the, the crew in the helicopter on the other side from the other squad members and engaged them and uh, we got back into the helicopter and, you know, with, with the courier bag and later they sent what, uh, another, we had a, what was called a, a pink team flying overhead as cover because it would have been more than embarrassing that if we, if something had happened to us and we lost the helicopter with the gear into it, 
I mean, heads actually rolled for the mission later on. But um, he was able to um, collect some serious uh, data that helped the 101st prepare for attacks and such. Uh, when we landed back, uh, we picked up with the other helicopter, and uh, we, um, I had to search the body for documents and such. And, uh, you know, I had been there a while, and I figured, you know, the officers were all more experienced. And the pilot said to us while we are sitting there uh, that uh, that was the first NBA he ever saw. And I went like, oh, boy, <laughs> I guess I'm not the wet kid behind the ears, you know. And it you know, made an impression on me. Uh, you know, you're looking at a, now this is years later, you're looking at a, per, a person's personal effects at, you know. And you, you realize it's, you know, unfortunately it's real. It's all real, you know. So um, after that, we went back to the company and um, our missions got canceled after that because um, we, um, part of the being with the 265th and 101st, we had dual reporting. We also reported the field station because we were an Army security agency. The last thing the Army, the field station wanted was, even though we were, were a part of the 101st, they had responsibility for us, they had our personal records too. So they um, actually reprimanded, uh, or not reprimanded, threatened court martial in my company commander. And I actually saw the uh, letter reprimand in his records. He still has it to this day. And he grouses over it. Um, it wasn't a career ender, ender or anything, but we were told not to tell anybody about the, what we were doing because it was very compartmentalized. Even the other guys in our, our platoon, uh, I mean, in our company, didn't even know about it until years later. But we were told it never happened. It didn't happen because we were taking unacceptable risks at the time for what we were tasked to do. One thing being on the hill with an infantry company, Another thing being on, being out flying around looking for stuff. And the interesting thing is, some, depending on the helicopter we got, sometimes we had machine guns on it, and some, you know, um, side guns like that. It was a gunship, which we learned how to use because days prior to Turo, he was a door gunner. So it was pretty easy to pick it up. Um, and we we're all trained in using uh, M60s anyways. And sometimes we weren't armed. We, were, we just had the doors pinned back and we had uh, loose weapons in, in the helicopter. And I always used to joke, I said, why do we even have to bring radio gear? We're an American helicopter flying over enemy territory. They're going to shoot at us anyways. Well, no, we don't have to bring anything. They're going to know where they're going to, you know, we're going to know where they are. But, um, but that was the mission. And we were supporting uh, 1st Brigade 101st. And, uh, and it was, it was, I had no regrets. I mean, it was really interesting. And a lot of, you know, sometimes, Folks would grouse because, you know, you guys are gung-ho or this, that, and the other. But I never looked at it that way, you know. And then years later, those same people said, geez, I wish I had done that because I just stayed back in the field station and um, did nothing. So um, that that went by the wayside. The division... That was your last. Yeah, that was... Yeah, they got, they got word of that. And they put the, uh, don't, you know, don't... Don't say anything. Don't. It never went. No, we didn't do a lot of after action reports uh, because uh, it would go back and go to the hundred first and use the data. Basically, we would we were supposed to submit it to the other folks and then they would filter it, give it to to the hundred first because the hundred first was not supposed to know where it came from. It was all because of security reasons, which was kind of defeated the purpose of tactical intelligence. You want stuff that's actionable right away. Um, so it come the end of 71, um, probably the, the, the other most, uh, this is past Thanksgiving time, I got to see Bob, the Bob Hope Show, I think. It, when, and I met um, John McCain's father, Admiral McCain, at the show because he was the Pacific commander for all American forces in Vietnam. And that was, that was interesting and uh, um, got to meet him. And then the division uh, decided they were going to go home. And um, I thought I was going to, in early January, 72, so I thought I and all the major units are already gone up in northern northern way in Quantry Province. Marines mostly were gone except for some advisors. The cab was gone. The only di combat division was 101st. So in January, my company um, got orders to stand down, and um, I was so I thought I was going to get to go home because <laughs> I'd been counting my time in time. Um, 
I thought I was going to, you know, have, I had a year overseas and they came back to me and said, you have a critical MOS, you're kind of going to stay here. And I said, well, I'll put in for leave for, uh, you know, for uh, R&R for Australia. I had already been to Thailand, so I'd uh, been stationed here, so I knew all about Thailand. So I said, I'd, I'd like to go to Australia. And they said, fine. Well, about a week later, they came back and canceled that, too. So I went back to, <coughs> excuse me, not knowing where the rest of my friends went to. And it was years later, because they broke us all up, um, to where Frank was going to. I went back to Fubai, which was a field station. It would have been trailer duty and working basically in a, a field station, which is, again, not what I wanted. These guys had their weapons locked up. It was, it was almost stateside duty in Vietnam. So they were looking for volunteers to go up to a, what was left of another unit that supported the 5th Mech up on the DMZ. And uh, I volunteered for that, and then they had ideas. At one time, we used to go out with ranger teams. They'd insert us with wiretap equipment. They'd find an NBA landline in the Ashraf Valley, and they'd go sit on it with wiretap gear for a day or two and monitor, record the conversations. And uh, they decided that was a little too dangerous to do now. They, and, but one time they did that. And I knew guys that did, you know, it's really a trip, so to speak. But um, we never lost anybody. I, even our company never lost anybody. Our, I credit our company commander for, I mean, while the flying was very, very dangerous, we never lost, we never took unacceptable risks. So um, anyways, I ended up back in Fubai, and I knew this wasn't for me because I was in a, I had been in a combat unit and been out in the field, not as much as a grunt was, but pretty darn close because we were with them right next to us. Um, you know, most of the time, either being on the hilltop or doing the flying stuff. So back at Fubai, I, I volunteered to go up to what used to be called the 407th Radio Research Detachment. They used to do um, their intercept work on a because the 5th Mech was a track unit personnel carriers and uh, M, I think 113. They had the radio gear in that while um, the 5th Mech went home, but the unit stayed up there. They were based in Quan Tree across, I think it was called uh, White White Star Compound, maybe, uh, across from the airfield and off of QL1. And um, so I got a chopper with another friend of mine uh, and we went up to Quan Tree and uh, reported there. Uh, Initially, uh, when I got there, they said, uh, we, we've got enough people. There was about nine of us. And at the time, there was only 40, I think, 41 Americans in the province. They were uh, MACV 155 folks, um, Marine Corps advisors, Naval Air gun, Gunfire support people, and, um, and about nine signal intelligence guys. And one of, the, one of the Marines I met up there at A4, which was Khan Chen, was a guy named, he was an advisor named Walt Boomer, who became um, the commandant of the Marine Corps during the first Desert Storm, I believe, in 1991. But he figures into something that happened to our unit late, a little bit later. So I, I get to the unit, I report in, and they say, well, we're going to send you back to Fubai. And I had about four months left in country left then. I was supposed to leave... Uh, May 1st. So uh, I said, please don't send me back there. I'll end up in jail, you know, because I didn't want to do that kind of duty. I mean, plus they didn't like, they didn't have a great love for the 265th, even though we had gone to the same type of schools because we were out in the field and these guys were doing state, more or less stateside duty. They had a swimming pool, they had a mess hall, and they, you know, they had pretty comfy air conditioned trailers and such. So I got up there and I said, "Look, you know, send me back. You know, send me back." So they said, "Well, we've got <coughs> basically um, two types of mission, and uh, and we have this guy. We have guys at A4, which was Marine Corps, called Con 10, which was downsized to, to about the size of a postage stamp in seventy late seventy one when everybody went home. We had other guys involved in." with something that was very highly classified, it was called the Explorer Program. And if you do some searching on it, you could probably find some information. It was ground-based intercept radar, uh, voice communications. And I guess I could, and that was on top of the hilltop. 
there was an earlier program in the war, it was at a place called Hickory Hill, where um, John Cavavino, they had special forces guys uh, monitor our, our equipment up on the Ashaw Valley. And they got overrun. He won the Medal of Honor, was a prisoner of war. I had the honor of meeting him a few years ago when he recovered one of his brothers that uh, was killed at that place. And the sergeant, um, I think, uh, I can't remember John Smith, I'm going to say Smith, but I'm not sure. But if, if somebody looks up Hickory Hill, you can find out all about it. About that. So we basically, later in the war, we had the same gear up on Firebase Sarge. So they said, um, well, um, we can send you up there and you could monitor. The equipment more or less took them, took care of itself. It was a remote, remote intercept that scanned um, NVA frequencies and intercepted communications based off, uh, yeah, well, I'm not going to jail. <laughs> keywords that were used in the conversation and relayed the information back to uh, the field station and the back to NSA in almost real time and through satellite, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. A lot of it, like I said, was declassified but re redacted a lot in 2012. It was that, you know, it's basically the same type of um, system they use nowadays on a smaller, more probably computerized basis. Mm -hmm. And um, I was not, I'm not familiar with all the technical stuff because I was an analyst, basically. I've done everything but that, really. So they needed somebody on the hill to feed the diesel because you had to have the generators and more or less to keep the Vietnamese from uh, vandalizing the site. So they had, they would put a generator mech up there and anybody else it was free. And we'd rotate off the, off the hilltop. Well, it wasn't to come because when we came to have the discussion about who was going to go, uh, a fellow named Gary Westcott and uh, uh, what's the other uh, Crosby is his uh, last name uh, blanking out on his first name I should know he was from upstate New York uh, Westcott was from California and uh, they decided they wanted to go because uh, they had been in the company in that new company that I was new to um, longer than I was, so they kind of like had picked the litter, so to speak, of the assignment, you know, what we were going to do. And I said, well, I don't care what I do as long as I don't go back to uh, Fubai. So they went up to that, to that hilltop. I helped close down a place called uh, Camp Carroll, which was, uh, we had an intercept site, and what used to be a, named after J.J. Carroll, a, mar a Marine that was killed earlier, and the Army had uh, 175s there. And we had an intercept position, so we closed because things were winding down in '72. Um, we um, closed that down. We went in there, destroyed the equipment. I almost killed myself destroying the equipment. Being a young stupid kid, uh, we had R390 radios, which were about that big in the metal case, and a, a but reinforced uh, wood timber bunker. So they said, "Go in here, take the fire axes, go in there, smash up the radios." I was with another guy, Chuck Martin, who I been in touch with over the years too. I said, oh, the hell with the, hell with the, you know, the sledgehammers and, excuse me, and the uh, fire axes, I'm going to shoot it up. So I pulled out my 45 and I started to pump a couple rounds into the face of the radio, just enjoying destroying government equipment. And I vaguely remember a ricochet passing my left shoulder and, uh, <laughs> That was the end of that. I kind of stopped doing that. Plus, the ringing ears and on closed bunker shooting a gun. And uh, years later, at a memorial service, he introduced me to his wife and um, said, this is the guy that almost got us killed one day by, by destroying equipment. But we closed up Carroll. We went back to Quantry where we ran a little compound. And uh, we, I rotated back to A4. We would put... Uh, we had guys at that place too. We had an explorer position there, and they would copy code, and uh, they were in groups of numbers. And uh, we would, over the radio, secure radio, we'd send it back just a few miles back in real time to uh, Quantree, and they would copy it down, and they would forward it to NSA and back to the field station. While we were there, we were very often uh, shelled because you could see the Menha River in the north. And you know, actually, it was a the northernmost um, place that um, you could be assigned to, you know, and what would happen is you'd 
it would be Vietnamese Arvins there, or Marines. They'd spend 30 days there. They'd rotate off the hill. Then an armor unit would come up and rotate off the hill. And then, but we would stay there. Our, a few guys would be there. And every two weeks, I would be out there for two weeks. And then I'd switch with a guy back a few miles, and we'd, we'd do that. Um, probably the craziest thing that happened while we were up there one day is, well, the Arvin Army guys walked off the hill while the, the protocol was for the new guys to come in at the same time. There'll be a, a company of guys. Nobody came in. So a few of our guys sat on that hill for 24 hours on the edge of the southern edge of the DMZ that a squad of NVA could overrun it and, um, you know, basically just waiting for the other Vietnamese to, unit to come up. When the higher field station heard that, there was hell to pay that, uh, because these guys were sitting there, you know, very extremely exposed to classified stuff, equipment and uh, gear and everything else like that. So I did that while I was up there. I also did some other things because it wasn't just you worked your MLS, you, you did other things. Uh, we'd have to resupply our guys because uh, we couldn't, um, couldn't fly into a lot of places because of weather and such. So we'd uh, drive up QL... Uh, Route 9 through Dong Ha and up that way, and Cuviet River to Cam Lo and go up to uh, to the backside of, <coughs> excuse me, the backside of A4 and bring sea rats and radio stuff and batteries. Or we drive down to Fubai 50 miles away, down QL1, which was a daunting task because we'd always wait to get an ambush. But we'd come back with, we'd be riding in a truck with, filled with 55 gallons of barrels of diesel fuel and ammo and food gas. And we'd have a helicopter escort over the top of us in case something happened. They would know what happened. And I'd always laugh. I'd not laugh, but I'd say, geez, that's a lot of good because, boy, if we ever got ambushed, we're going to go up in a ball of flame. All they're going to say is, yeah, they're dead. And that's it. So and we, we'd go into Fubai and we'd go to Lee Fubai and we'd, we'd have to go through a checkpoint and we'd go through the MPs and the MPs would say, uh, where are you going? Are you going into Way to fool around? Because we were a little bit below, Fubai was a little bit below Way. And we say, no, we're going up to the DMZ, up to Quant Tree. And they would, they'd say to us, there are no Americans up there. And even, you know, in early 72, they, you know, they thought the war was over. But you're 50 miles up the road, and they were soon to find out um, the war wasn't over. So we were, uh, while up at A4, I got to see a lot of brave Air Force pilots bomb the DMZ. Just sort of like uh, nowadays you're watching TV, but it was, we're sitting on top of the, uh, on top of the bunker. And uh, w since we had the codes broken for the d firing designators for the NBA batteries on the other side, we knew when they were going <laughs> to shoot at us, you know, with rockets or uh, 130 field guns. So... Uh, we would go in, and the Vietnamese would watch us. So they saw us go underground. They would start to hunker down too, because within a few minutes we'd be shelled. So one of the other things I saw, and nobody believed us to begin with, uh, we saw a South Vietnamese forward air controller get shot down. He was flying over the DMZ, spotting for the unit, a uh, South Vietnamese unit, and he got blown right out of the sky. And we called back on the radio, and they said, "Ah, that didn't happen. It couldn't have happened." As they were in disbelief, we were telling them from, from probably late January, February, and March, uh, something's happening. They're building up. They're, you're seeing that we're actually watching the trucks cross from a distance across the bridge of the Ben Ha River into the western parts of Quantree Province. So one of the other things I saw while I was there, I saw, and I didn't really know, know what was happening. I watched a plane go in low, and... Uh, I saw something drop off the wing, and not knowing a lot about Air Force and at that time about Air Force bureaucracy and such, the guy had dropped a missile off in a sidewinder, I believe, and it ignited, and it took off, and he had just, and then the ground shook, the, you wouldn't believe, and he had just shot down a SAM missile, because they had SAM batteries right along the DMZ. And again, we called that back to full body and said, uh, you know, they shot down a SAM missile. Oh, there's no SAM batteries up there, you know. And we're going like, oh man, the crap's going to hit the fan. Folks who were at the field station were in total stateside mode and disbelief. So um, you know, while this is all going out, and I'm on A4, the other got two friends are out on, on Sarge. So um, I went back to, uh, 
I was, the month of March had started to wind down. I had another month of, month of April. And this is basically just rotating back and forth. And, um, and it was pretty, it was interesting, but it was strange being in a, a mixed unit of folks. You know, a lot of Marine, like I said, Marine officers earned a lot of respect for those guys, what they did being out there with Vietnamese and, you know, basically nobody having their backs. Um, been, uh, so I, I got orders to, uh, I got a month drop out of Vietnam. So instead of leaving uh, May 1st, I was going to leave um, April 1st. March 30th, uh, I believe, also. So around that day time. So I had orders, um, and I don't even know who I traded with over the over Secure Voice. I told I had orders to go to Fort Meade, Maryland, NSA headquarters. And I said, damn, I don't want to go, uh, go to a... It, it's like working in the Pentagon, basically. And it was. And I know a lot of folks that were there. Thought it was a smart move at the time, later on. I can explain it wasn't such a smart move, but I traded with orders to go to another tactical unit and go to Fort Bragg, uh, 313th ASA Battalion. So uh, I actually left country 27 or 28 March. Unfortunately, on 30 March, I lost my two friends at the place on um, Firebase Sarge. It was actually the 30th was the, when we were getting shelled, we knew the stuff was gonna happen. And they were evacuating. The Vietnamese civilians were going on QL1 like uh, like the folks going into Walmart at Christmas. I mean, they're just going the opposite way. And, um, we knew, you know, when they when they moved, you knew stuff was was going to happen, and nobody was believing us. And uh, so we lost two guys up there. Their bunker took a direct hit from, or well, the bunker with the classified gear took a direct hit with a. They believe either recoilless rifle or a 130 field gun or a 122. The only witness was this wall at there up at that hill was Walt Boomer, who who was the American witness to the uh, the bunker going up, and he tried to recover the bodies. They couldn't. They were just buried within the rubble and such, and it actually burned for three days. I understand because I read all the reports later on. It took him nine days to get back to Quan Tri with the Vietnamese unit. So this all happens on the day I'm leaving country, going home to be safe and sound. And uh, bodies were never recovered. Uh, uh, years later, I got involved with JPAC and uh, that for trying to locate the, the remains and such. And I'll get to that a little bit later because that doesn't fall in right here. But I, I came home for a leave and in my parents were happy to see me. I, I never did. I didn't speak too much of what I did. Uh, my dad knew I was doing something classified because he said, "While you're gone, folks were asking the neighbors, you know, about you know, initially about your background and such, and you ever been in trouble." And he said, "What the hell are you doing?" And I said, "I really can't tell you what I was doing because we had we we weren't allowed to talk about stuff because it was still classified, and uh, I had to sign a, a non-disclosure, and I couldn't travel to a communist country for." Well, after I got out for six years. So I was home for a, a month, and um, you know, Vietnam wasn't too popular. I kind of kept to myself. There wasn't too many folks around that had been to Vietnam. My parents, I found out, had told people I was away at college. And, and when I got asked about that, where did I go to college, I told you, I told you I was in Vietnam, and folks couldn't believe it. I, don't, I never knew if my parents got grief because I had gone to Vietnam or what. I never know. So I, I spent a month home and felt kind of out of place, you know. I, f I felt a lot older, no, no doubt. And uh, I reported in Fort Bragg and, uh, down in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Basically a tactical ASA unit. It was called ASA at the time. Well, Vietnam, we were radio research co cover name that never fooled anybody. But, <laughs> but uh, that's why you'll hear RRUs and DSUs. But um, Fort Bragg was, I mean, it was interesting. It was uh, down south, first time in there, hotter than heck. But the first winter I'm there, um, I, uh, it snowed, which was kind of funny. <laughs> and people were besides themselves. So we did uh, field exercises, basically field exercises, and uh, went out into the, the woods in North Carolina, up into Montana one time. And... Um, did, like I said, field exercises. When we weren't doing that, I was assigned to, I guess General Westmoreland was the head of the Army at 
at the time, a chief staff or something, and they came up with self-help battalions. So within, beside your regular MOS and training, you had to um, have something else to do. So the self-help battalion was basically a maintenance battalion, and we were responsible for taking care of the barracks, the electrical stuff, the fences, you know, built carpentry and stuff like that. So it was, it was pretty interesting. And I worked for an old uh, Southern Staff Sergeant who had spent his previous tour in Ethiopia guide doing, uh, guide, guiding people on hunting trips. So basically what I did for him while we were in our little old place at Smoke Bomb Hill was did shotgun reloading for him and so he could go skeet shooting when we, he wasn't doing training. So part of the mission of the battalion is uh, we support, we had two companies. One was headquarters company that supported the 18th Corps, which was a non-airborne unit. I mean, it was airborne, but uh, it wasn't all airborne. And we had airborne guys in the in the company headquarters. We had three five eighth who went with was a, more of a direct support unit supported the 82nd Airborne. They were all um, airborne qualified. You knew a lot of the guys, so. Somebody came up with the idea, or the Army came up with the idea, we're going to make everybody all airborne. This was in 70, 72. So uh, I volunteered to be in the pre back platoon, which was a pre-basic airborne training to get you in shape to go to airborne school, learn a lot of the ground school stuff at Fort Bragg, do tower jumps. Uh, we were responsible for going out to the jump zone on Thursdays and watching the guys do the jumps, do the equipment checks, the, the ground training that's involved, uh, getting ready to go to the jump school. One of the other joys of this was that while the, com the company did um, PT and only did a mile run at Fort Bragg, we got to do four mile runs, which, you know, I was back from Vietnam, I was in decent shape, which, which wasn't too bad, but I was getting a little bit older compared to everybody else. But what impressed me, we were um, billeted right next to the Special Forces training people, John F. Kennedy uh, School for Special Forces. So while we used to fall out at 5.30, 6 in the morning to go for a nice four-mile run in boots and, and fatigues, these guys, the training guys that were for the uh, Special Forces were coming in <laughs> at 5.30 in the morning, running I don't know how far with rucksacks and everything else. So uh, kind of, it could be the worse. And I mean, in a good way, you know, at least, because those guys were tough, tough characters. And you know, a lot of them were vet, the guys that were doing the train, were the trainers were Vietnam veterans. And they were decorated beyond belief that, uh, a lot of respect for them. So I, so I spent a year there, do, you know, doing the field exercises, doing the self-help battalion, get ready to go to jump school. I was up for stat, I mean, I was up for Buck Sergeant E5. I had one more year on my enlistment. And this was was about, and I was on audits for jump school. And that was probably around, uh, let's see, uh, April, probably April of 73, another month left. So I got called into the company commander and he said, you're up, you know, you've gone before the E-5 board, you're on the list. Um, but what has happened is the Army at the time when we enlisted, it was a four-year enlistment. Somebody had for some reason filed a, a lawsuit or something and they dropped the enlistments down to three years. So I had the option of giving, uh, waving off my early out or drop. Um, and I had had ideas of making a career out of the, out of the military. I had liked what I did. I had no regrets of all the stuff I had seen and done. And um, So I, I asked him, what's, you know, what's the situation? I said, I'm up for E5. I said, if you promote me to E5, I'll stay and fill, you know, do the other and probably re-enlist. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, what we're going to do is uh, you have to wave off, you know, sign off the waiver and then we'll promote you afterwards. And I said, well, I'm not talking about spending another year, um, you know, and possibly more in the military. You're not going to. And I kind of insinuated, I didn't say it in plain English, you're not going to take me on my word, because they were afraid. They only had so many slots for promotion, and we had guys coming in from basic, or from AIT into the unit too. So you had a mix of old guys leaving, getting out of the Army, and new guys coming in the Army, so they didn't want to give up the promotion slot. They only had so many slots to, guy, to a guy who was going to get out in another month. And I said, no, 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 I'm not going to get out. And uh, he said, no, no, you got to do this. And I said, well, if you're not going to take me on my word, I will get out. 
So I got out and, um, and you know, kind of regret it now. I mean, I didn't get to go to jump school and part of, me, part of me is glad I didn't because a lot of my friends now at older in life suffered for the uh, effects of going to jump school. I mean, I used to see guys come in with, you know, get dragged across the drop zone, uh, read accident reports about folks going into power lines. So I ETSed out of the Army, and uh, but I had a real love for aviation. So what do I do? I come back to Connecticut, and I end up um, joining the Army Reserve. And I almost joined the, the Connecticut National Guard. We had, uh, my dad had known somebody that served in the Guard and became, uh, he was a captain at time, Frank Briganti, who became the commanding general of the Avcrats in um, Groton, Connecticut. And never a bad choice of not going into the Connecticut Guard. That was probably the worst decision I ever made. My dad had kind of convinced me to go into the reserve because the Guard was more of a political organization and it was who you knew and such, while the reserve I knew was federal. So I joined the reserve and I joined the 76th Division in West Hartford. They want they want me to be a drill sergeant. I said, nah, nah, this guy isn't going to be a drill sergeant. I never, I was in, I never did stateside duty. I didn't know all the marching stuff, all the drill sergeant stuff. I said, I want to go into the aviation unit. So at the time they flew helicopters out of, out of, um, Brainerd Field here in Hartford. So I joined six months later. They moved the unit up to my old ASA unit was more Army Airfield at Fort Devens. So I'm drilling Fort Devens once a month, driving an hour and a half to drill, which I did for approximately nine to ten years. While I was there, um, I went on active duty. I was initially assigned as a. I was no longer a, 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 had the a, I had the ASA AMOS, but it wasn't my duty AMOS. I was a sixty seven initially a sixty seven November twenty, which was a helicopter recruit uh, uh, repairman. I had been working at Pratt and Whitney. I had studied um, the book the the MOS books in the military, and at the time you could take the MOS test. And if you passed it, you were awarded the MOS without going to school. So initially, I was awarded that MOS. I crewed a, a helicopter up there. And then a few years passed down the road, and um, they lost their um, fixed wing maintenance mechanic. Because it was a small unit. Like, there was maybe nine pilots. We had about six enlisted. We had crew chief, two crew chiefs. Uh, for the two helicopters, which I was one of them. Then we had two. We had one mechanic for the fixed one. We had the Havlin Beaver. We had a, uh, two, a maintenance officer and an NCOIC. I think that was it. All our pilots were Vietnam pilots, which was pretty cool. So things were pretty informal. We used to um, push the haircut limits to um, to no end. And I uh, couldn't go on the base because... Um, if the MPs caught you with long hair, you'd get in trouble. But I used to go back, since the ASA was still active then, I'd go back to the old ASA mess hall and eat with guys I used to know that stayed in. So um, while, while I was there, they asked me to go on active duty. And I went to active duty school at Fort Eustis for a better part of half a year, a little bit more in 1980, to become a fixed wing uh, repairman, 67 Golf 20, involved uh, working on Mohawks, Beaver, well, we didn't have too many Beavers there, but Mo Mohawks, Beach King Airs, um, Beach Seminoles, uh, uh, and then uh, I believe the other one was uh, Bona a Bonanza, too, civilian equivalent. So um, I did that while I was in the reserve. And then I find out if I had joined the Guard, I would have probably made a lot more rank because of Frank McGanty ends up being the head of all the uh, aviation assets at um, for the state of Connecticut. Uh, bad choice. While also at Fort Eustis in 1980, got asked to go back. I had been unemployed for a while after graduating Central here in 77, and my wife was a teacher at the time I was married. I got asked to uh, go back in the Army. I had 10 years counting. They would have given me 10 years before my active and reserve towards uh, retirement. What had happened is up until this time, aviation and the military and the army was part of the transportation corps. Being at Fort Eustis, I learned the army had trains and boats, 
which airboats, which I didn't know about at the time, and they also had aviation stuff. So they were looking for, um, because they had gotten rid of a lot of people post-Vietnam, so they had this gap for uh, mil for pilots, for crewmen, for maintenance folks. So I had I said, what does it entail? And they said, um, we'd send you to warrant school for 27 weeks, and then you'd, you'd, you'd be on Grumman um, Mohawks. And I said, what, what would be my duty station? And they said, Germany, uh, Fort Eustis here in South Korea. And I went like, okay. I said, could I fly? And I, w I wear glasses. And they said, uh-uh. And uh, I said, well, I'm correctable to 2020. You only have to see two feet in front of you. And they said they had made the um, regulations a lot um, stricter. So that, and I said, well, geez, during Vietnam, I flew with guys with no co without college degrees, without wearing glasses. And he said, that was Vietnam. We were losing pilots left and right. And I went, oh, that's nice. So I said, okay. They gave me a phone number. I had all, they had all my records. I had passed my physical. I came home to Connecticut here and um, I told my wife, I said, geez, you know, I got to ask you to go back in the Army. Well, she's a hometown girl. She never grew up until us traveling, she's not really been around the country. And she was established in her teaching position. So I said, look, if I don't get a job around here, um, I'm gonna go back in the army because I didn't, I liked it. And um, we'll see what happens. And um, also I said, there's a chance of becoming an officer. I had, I'm already halfway to retirement. And um, she said, okay, we'll do that. So I literally, Went around, couldn't get anything, was working a hodgepodge of jobs, guards, guard duty, uh, things like that. So I had the aviation background, so I had the idea of going to Pratt Whitney Aircraft and see if I could get a job there. Um, I applied in East Hartford at Experimental, at the time Pratt Whitney had, uh, didn't have a centralized job posting or a job hiring department. You had to apply at each plant. So I went over to, um, East, uh, I had tried Colt, couldn't get into Colt. I wanted to get into their gun shop, the repair shop. So I tried Pratt. I went over to uh, East Hartford, applied for experimental engineering as a mechanic because I, I had the reserve experience and um, put an application. Went over to Southington, Connecticut, and got interviewed by a woman called Beth Pendleton. She looked at my military background and everything else in, um, in the college and she said, boy, you, you're a perfect candidate for the overhaul repair shop or Pratt when you overhaul military and commercial engines. So I um, went over there and uh, I, it was the old days. It wasn't uh, hiring by committee. It was hiring by getting an interview by the general foreman who was an old, crusty old 40 year Pratt veteran. So basically he laid down books in front of me and blueprints and said, tell me what you see. And he says, apparently you know what you're talking about but he said, you only have one drawback. And um, yeah. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, you have college. And I said, huh? And I said, and he told me, you're going to be bored in seven years. He said, I can't. It takes a good year or two to train a mechanic here. So um, I said, I need a job. And it was a whole seven dollars and seventy cents an hour at the time in 1980, and um, I got hired. I ended up st staying at Pratt and Whitney for 30 years. I worked my way up from um, being in the overhaul shop, and it was hard to get out of there because they didn't. Um, they had to release you. You had a job already within the company. Well, while that happened, they went to Central. Um, job posting on computers where you could apply electronically. So having the college, knowing I wasn't going to really go in, where I was a grade two, a senior jet engine, what they called a senior jet engine mechanic, I posted for a salary position and I put in seven applications and I got, I got four interviews and I got hired for within the company for, or train, hired and interviewed for two jobs. One of them I chose was called maintenance data engineering and I, I wrote, and we were responsible for the manuals for the aircraft. But since I had the hands-on experience of the military, my uh, the person I ended up working for, Bill Joyner, was a retired Navy uh, chief, and his dad had flown with Curtis LeMay, 
during World War II. Um, he wanted me to work for him, and uh, I worked for him doing uh, time compliance tech orders for the F-15 and F-22 Raptor program when that came up. And I was the only guy in practically responsible for taking um, a lot of um, engineering data and putting it into a workable document to work with the Air Force. And I got to go out and do validations and verifications with the maintenance folks. And um, started out with the, as a engine mechanic, and I retired in 19, six, um, 19, yeah, 2010 as a, a, a staff engineer on the F-22 Raptor program. And, that, and I think that probably about it. So you had a, a pretty busy life. Your how would you say your military experiences impacted your life after? It sounds like you kind of summed it up, but I just kind of yeah. How do you, do you say um, it was a positive impact? Or it? Yeah, positive impact. Um, basically, um, made uh, learned. Uh, I learned. I knew this before. I went in. My dad once told me. Never tell anybody to do something you can't do yourself, especially in the military. And, I, and your word is your word. And I've been that way all my life. I think uh, the military just reinforced that. Uh, I've got friendship with guys I've, I've known since 1971 in Vietnam. We're still in touch. We see each other a couple times a year. A few of them. Uh, and then I've met other ones since then within my unit that we were there at the same time. One of my friends, I was actually his replacement in 1971, and he's out in Oregon. I see him now and then. And I, I've met other guys that were there at the same time in the same company, but uh, deployed out to a fire base or, because we were geographically separated, even though within the one company, you know. So, but it helped me. Um, more. I enjoyed my college at Central. My degree was in East Asian Studies, Political Science what I had an interest in. Um, but the military, the aviation background definitely gave me my career at Pratt & Whitney. And that I can attribute to um, the military. You know, that volunteering to flying in Vietnam. Not doing that, I might have never got bit by the aviation bug or such. Um, the college did help later on with the because the college was a requirement for a salary position at the time. So having the college in the hands-on was a double whammy. You know, that was helpful. Well, John, I want to thank you for uh, for your service and also for taking the opportunity to talk to us today. Yep. All right. Thank you, too.